episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, and today we are going to be segueing back into the area and the topic of aging and healthy longevity. We're going to be talking about dementia as well. And we have the honor today of being joined by Nora Super, who is a senior director of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, as well as an executive director of the Milken Institute Alliance to Improve Dementia Care. Uh, Mr. provides strategic direction for the two primary focuses of the organization uh, in terms of uh, the future of aging, financial wellness, and healthy longevity, uh, and oversees uh, their data-driven research, the policy initiatives, and a variety of their uh, convenings around the world. Uh, the Alliance to Improve Dementia Care, which he also oversees, which was launched in 2020, ultimately seeks to transform and pr improve the uh, complex health and long-term care systems uh, that people at risk for and living with dementia have to navigate nowadays. Um, Ms. Super studied political science at Tulane University, completed her master's degree uh, in public administration with a concentration in health policy at George Washington University, uh, and is a respected thought leader, a frequent speaker, and prolific writer on a range of topics, including healthy longevity and the economic and social impact uh, of global population aging. Uh, in 2019, she offered two major reports, uh, reducing the cost and risk of dementia, recommendations to improve brain health, and to Increased disparities and age forward cities for the year 2030. Uh, before joining the Milken Institute, uh, she led several uh, key leadership roles in both public and private sectors. In 2014, uh, President Barack Obama appointed her executive director of the White House Conference on Aging, uh, where she received wide recognition for nationwide efforts to improve the lives of older Americans. Uh, in 2015, she was recognized as one of America's top 50 influencers in aging by PBS Next Avenue and was the honoree for outstanding service to Medicare beneficiaries by the Medicare Rights Center. She's also held leadership roles at a variety of organizations at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, at AARP, Kaiser Permanente, and at the National Association of Areas of Agencies on Aging. Uh, serves on a wide range of boards. I won't go to this long list, but we can uh, put them in the bio later on. But uh, Nora Super, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule today. Talk to us. Great. Thank you. Happy to be with you. It, it, it's great having you. Um, you know, I, I'd love to start things off just uh, by handing you the floor to talk for a couple minutes uh, in general about uh, yourself and, and sort of why aging. Uh, how did you get involved in this space? How has it become such an important uh, area for you uh, to focus on during your career? Sure. Um, well, you know, I often tell people that I come to aging from two very different perspectives that have influenced me a great deal. Um, my mother died at the age of 51 of breast cancer. And so uh, her death really made me aware of how short life is and how we really need to take advantage of every moment. We never know when our last day will be. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, my father had Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And so his death was much more prolonged and uh, we worked with he and his three siblings all had Alzheimer's disease so it's really impacted my family a lot so when I look at the issue of aging it's really like how do we have uh, more life in our years and make sure that we can be as healthy as possible um, for as long as possible seeing both ends of that spectrum you know um, I have been working in and out of health and retirement for most of my career in, um, in the Washington, D.C. area. And really do think, as, as you mentioned, that healthy longevity and financial wellness go hand in hand. Um, you know, the statistics that we see about um, disparities in health, life expectancy rates are very closely tied to people's socioeconomic um, situation. And so that too is part of the what we need to work on if we're really going to um, have healthy aging for all. We need to look at people's economic status and the opportunities that they have throughout life. And, and I just uh, I grew up sort of 
late 60s, early 70s, uh, familiar with Michael Milken sort of from finance days, a little less in terms of the philanthropy, but I do remember a reading, you know, from the early days, I think it almost got started in more as a, a cancer-focused philanthropy. Uh, the Milken organization seems to do lots of stuff nowadays beyond health in terms of economics, uh, and medical research, innovation, so forth. Could you give us just a couple of minutes on the Milken uh, Institute in general and, and sort of where your uh, pieces in terms of healthy aging, in terms of the dementia care, sit within the organization? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, we are a global organization, as you mentioned. We have offices, our headquarters are in Santa Monica and uh, California, and then we also have an office of about 60 people in Washington, D.C., and then we have offices in Abu Dhabi, London, um, and Singapore as well. So we really have a global reach. Um, Mike Milken, as you mentioned, comes from the finance sector. So we've always had a big emphasis on uh, how access to capital can really transform lives. And so that's a big part of what we do. We have seven centers, one specifically focused on uh, financial markets, for example, that looks at you know questions like opportunity zones and infrastructure uh, practices. We have uh, four health-related centers that are uh, all in the DC area as well. We have Faster Cures, which you may have heard of, sure. and you mentioned that, um, really driven from Mike Milken's own passion about he got prostate cancer uh, early in his life and really feels that medical research saved his life. And so uh, trying to put, you know, uh, get some of those cures in the pipeline faster so that people who have diseases uh, get access to some uh, options to really um, beat their illness. We also have a Center for Public Health. We have a big uh, focus on public health initiatives and really how um, they can improve health for all. We have a Center for Strategic Philanthropy, which focuses uh, not only on health and, and has is doing more these days on uh, global warming and environmentalism as investors have become more interested in those issues. And, uh, but also working to really advise philanthropists on, on how to best utilize um, the, the assets they have uh, mm -hmm. to really make a difference. Um, so the Center for the Future of Aging sits within uh, all of these centers. We also have one, the Center for Regional Economics in California that's much more based on what's happening in the state of California with its own little country, as you know. But um, the Center for the Future of Aging, um, half of our team is in California, half of our team is in Washington. Uh, we really look at these two areas of financial wellness and healthy longevity that we go through there. And we work collaboratively with many of our centers as you might, uh, aging really touches on almost everything. Um, and so all of these issues that we uh, work on across the Milken Institute, there's an aging component and an aging lens. And so we work collaboratively with the other centers and we take on uh, other initiatives that really focus more on, and we really do focus on the future of aging, mm -hmm. uh, really trying to change the trajectory for some folks um, as we see population aging really uh, happening. I would say that this is the first time in my career that I've worked for a global organization. And one of the uh, really things about the Milken Institute that interested me, and I've learned so much really about aging uh, across the globe and how it's different. And in our Asia Center in particular, we see really where we'll probably be in the next 10 or 15 years in the U.S. in terms of the aging population. And it's become such an economic issue in Asia. Still in the U.S., we tend to talk about it more um, as a health issue, or sometimes we talk about um, our programs such as Social Security and Medicare, but not so much about the impacts on the workforce, on the impacts of our economy, um, which is going to be coming and certainly has happened in Asia where some countries there, more than 25% of their population is over the age of 65. 
it's a fa it's a fascinating set of trends and you know <clears throat> speaking of those trends uh you 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 wrote this very impressive piece for uh the journal public policy and aging report uh it was entitled three trends shaping politics of aging in america and you highlight these three well, sort of staggering trends one uh that here our federal government will be spending over two-thirds of its budget on uh 65 and older in the next decade uh at the same time the number of caregivers uh, taking care of these folks uh, is going down. And we have this extreme concentration, you point out, uh, California, Florida, and Texas, 50% of it all. And you add in Georgia, Illinois, Michigan, New York, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, Ohio, you're over 75%. Could you talk a little bit about, because you're there sort of in, in the beltway and, 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 and with the sort of those power players, you've hung out at the White House. Um, talk a little bit about these trends if you would. And then also, um, you know, we just came out of a major election and obviously there's a lot of things that were discussed, uh, uh, you know, priorities that were debated uh, during that uh, period. Where does aging sit in all this? If there's a list, is it is it in the top 20? Is it somewhere in the top 100? We, we don't hear much about it as we hear about other things. Uh, talk a little bit of where it is as a political issue nowadays. Sure, happy to talk about that. And you know, I'll note that uh, we published that article in the Gerontological Society of America uh, before COVID. Yep. And so many of the trends that we were looking at then um, have been shaped by the pandemic and they've actually invited me to update it. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, how some of these trends have been impacted by the pandemic and what we see in the future. Um, I think as, you know, on the first trend about Social Security and Medicare, I've certainly, as I mentioned, lived in Washington for a long time um, and studied politics and policy. And we see this uh, common trajectory where we're, we're having a lot of spending right now. Um, President Biden came into office promising to really restart the economy and have uh, investments in infrastructure and families, et cetera. Um, but not as much attention to what we're spending on Social Security and Medicare, which are a huge share of the budget, as you mentioned, and mandatory spending and budget e as ease in DC, meaning that uh, we can't really cut that spending because we have obligations to all the individuals that are entitled to these benefits. So um, I think right now what we're seeing is an emphasis on spending and not so much on cutting spending, uh, but we almost always see the next uh, phase come in there. We wouldn't, um, you know, I think there, there will continue to be attention to Medicare and moving towards more value-based purchasing, uh, which really was both Republicans and Democrats support. I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you look at uh, Medicare spending, Medicaid spending, it's, it's really the only alternative we have is to really change the way we pay for services in the U.S. That being said, we still have uh, really astronomical costs that we pay for some pharmaceuticals. Those trends aren't changing. Um, I think we'll likely see, a, a you know, under President Biden, more focus on drug costs um, and trying to lower those drug costs and what we have there. But that's a tough political issue. I mean, you mentioned I was a uh, an anecdote I'll tell is I was a this uh, chief lobbyist for for ARP during health reform. And during that time, one of our core uh, issues that we worked on, we had six core things that we wanted to get done at ARP as part of health reform. And one was on the issue of biosimilars, um, which okay. really it, are these drugs that uh, generally are injected and um, they're, they're biologics. They tend to be very expensive. And a, a lot of that has to do with how long the patents are held by the sure. companies that created them. And we're seeing some of this play out. I saw a piece today even about uh, AstraZeneca and the Gates Foundation, how that they were involved in, in what we did with the vaccine. But also um, this was one of those issues that we fought hard on. This was when the, de the Democrats controlled the Congress um, and you know, we've knocked on every single door of every single senator's office. And out of 100 senators, we got 17 <laughs> to support uh, really minimizing this, uh, the patent level. And I think that just shows 
Mm -hmm. uh, the influence that a pharmaceutical industry has in our country. And, you know, they, they do many wonderful things and, and create, you know, life-saving vaccines and, and, you know, are hopefully work, finding a pathway for a cure for Alzheimer's, et cetera. But they're also just extremely expensive. Um, and so it makes it hard for some patients to really afford those uh, drugs. So I think we'll see movement in, in that. Uh, but, but the thing that concerns me really is the intergenerational warfare. And I think I mentioned that some in this piece, um, as we see, uh, you know, we've had recent reports, the New York Times had a piece on, this Sunday on the front page about population aging and really how that's happening across the globe where fertility rates are just declining everywhere. It's too expensive for people to have children. Um, that tends to be one of the number one reasons why people say they don't want to have more kids. And so we'll also see a trend, I think, into encouraging people to have more children, trying to do what many of these countries in Asia are doing, et cetera. But there'll be that tension between how much we're spending on older adults and younger adults um, in our country that will continue. I think the caregiver crisis is very real. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we we saw this even uh, amplified during the pandemic because we saw many, uh, you know, stories about people that were really trapped in their nursing homes and assisted living facilities, not allowed to see their relatives and others, uh, making people even more want to stay at home uh, rather than go into institutions, which puts a greater burden on the caregivers. We've yeah. seen women leaving the workforce because of this. Primarily women are caregivers, but men are doing it more and more. And it has an impact on our economy. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to take care of, you know, your loved one, especially someone who might have cognitive or, or severe physical limitations and work full time. Um, although, you know, being able to Zoom can help some with that. So there, there are definitely pros and cons. And, you know, and I think lastly, the concentration, that's something that's been severely impacted by the mm -hmm. pandemic. And we don't really have the data yet to see how significant this will be. But, you know, trends showing people moving out of New York City for good, you know, not wanting to pay those high rents uh, and mortgages anymore. Um, many people realizing they can work wherever they are, so they don't want to pay uh the cost of living in cities where we had seen such a trend towards people moving to cities. So I think that you will see uh, it will, that, that trend will be the most interesting to watch. I think of where people decide to live and locate. Some people moved closer to their parents to sure. help with that intergenerational, the grandparents helping with the kids or uh, older, you know, uh, adult children helping with the parents. And so that's one that we'll need to be tracking um, to see really um, how much the pandemic affects where people live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the intergenerational issue and then also, um, you know, with, with COVID, of course, we've all uh, directly and indirectly have, you know, in these homes, you know, we, we have homes, but we also have a care center here and, and everything, a school <laughs> and everything else. We're learning to um, to do more at home, or we learn to do a lot more at home. Uh, and one of the uh, interesting things when I, when I go sort of into now your area of healthy longevity uh, at the organization where you're involved in prevention, wellness, scientific advancement, uh, there seems to be a very interesting theme here in terms about not just uh, innovation, tech innovation, but this integrated health and, and home care. And we've gone into sort of this theme of aging in place, uh, the smart home, things of this nature on, on past shows. Um, talk a little bit about what you, obviously you, you're doing, you know, you, you do a lot, you, you, uh, you report and, and uh, on a lot of these themes. Um, talk about this one in general, because it's something that we've all had to experience, um, whether it's telehealth or telemedicine or whatever. How do you see some of these technologies that uh, have unfortunately come to the fore over the last year, helping out in sort of this tech enabled environment of health and home care for the elderly. Absolutely. Well, telehealth has been one of those uh, 
that that we've let the genie out of the bottle and I don't think we're putting it back in. Um, you know, much of the resistance to telehealth really was more on the patient uh, perspective that a lot of older adults felt like, well, they wanted to go in, they wanted to see their doctor. They weren't comfortable with the technology. Mm-hmm. Younger adults have been more comfortable to see it as saving time uh, that you don't have to go in, uh, you can do things. But once it was paid for in Medicare and people couldn't go to their doctors, uh, people become much more comfortable with it and were able to see, oh, this is easier to just talk to my doctor from my computer than to go downtown and park and pay for the parking and do all the things and take all this time out of my day. I think doctors have also become more comfortable with it, um, being able to use the technology, being able to use things so that they can work with patients and be able to do that. Um, so just in terms of that healthcare delivery change, I think that there'll be so much demand that it will be uh, nearly impossible for Congress to to switch back on that. Now, there's still a lot of legal issues that need to be worked out in terms of across state lines and whether, you know, what level of person can deliver um, some that will still be hard fought uh, mm-hmm. in the politics of aging. But I think um, the digital uh, issue, really, we're seeing such growth in that area. And we've actually launched a new project on integrated home and uh, health care. And I think one of the interesting things in my career, you know, I've really focused on both health care, but also long term care. Sure. And the two are sort of melding together these days. Um, we've seen this trend as more and more health systems and health plans focus on the social determinants of health yep. and recognizing that what, how healthy we are depends a lot more than what happens in the doctor's office. And many of these supportive services that we provide people for long-term care can really keep people out of the hospital, can keep mm-hmm. people from having surgeries, things that we can do to reduce that. The digital part, of course, uh, you know, one of the things we really need to test, and we did uh, we, sub- we submitted a new report this year on looking at long-term care options for middle-income households, mm-hmm. really focusing on middle-income because uh, we have a safety net of Medicaid. It's not perfect, but at least for the lowest-income people in our country, there is a safety net. And for high-income people, they can self-insure for this. But it's a lot of people in the middle that have uh, no resources, really, And this is, again, combining our lack of retirement savings with the trajectory of needing long-term care. And one of the things we really looked at are these technology solutions, but a lot of them haven't been that well tested to see, do they really save money or not? And I think that's one of the things that that we want to see going forward. You know, where can we provide resources um, where, where we can really make a, you know, really make an improvement in uh, the care that's delivered, but also do it in a cost-effective way. And Ira, I want to go back to your question because I remember I didn't really answer where does aging fit into all this um, in the politics of aging. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, uh, what we saw in the pandemic is much more widespread ageism. We really had been making... um, making progress in terms of seeing people that, uh, that, that are aging as, you know, an important part of our economy, as people that really can, uh, can provide, um, you know, much more, you know, in terms of working and volunteering and helping with many of the issues that we have. But because uh, COVID, unfortunately, really um, affected older people more than younger people, there was this ageism, like, well, everybody over 65, you know, like maybe they shouldn't even go back to work to keep our economy going. And this just really uh, focus or everybody lives in a nursing home or everybody's in assisted living. So I'm afraid that it's put us back into this negative view of aging Mm -hmm. where there are people that need to be taken care of. And again, uh, create some of that tension between generations. I also think, you know, having worked in the, uh, White House under President Obama, Mm -hmm. you know, as much as I admire President Biden and everything, aging was not an issue that he really wanted to engage in. Mm. And I think some of that because he's older himself and so didn't want to bring attention to those issues um, that, you know, there are definitely some upsides to aging, but there are definitely some downsides. So 
I think that um, we will see, and we saw with President Trump and President Biden really being okay with Social Security spending and, uh, and Medicare spending. But I do think that aging as a whole um, has, will take a backseat to many of the other issues um, that people are working on. And sometimes it's hard to get attention for those issues. Yeah, I um, was. I, I don't. I don't have experience down in the Beltway, but I, I do occasionally go to the uh, you know the the Senate Special Committee on Aging, and I look at this. I'm like, wow, these are <laughs> these are the power players of both sides of the aisle that you see on TV all the time, and you know, <laughs> you get your fingers crossed. Okay, you know, one of these folks, whether it's Elizabeth Warren or Marco Rubio or whomever, is going <laughs> to make this their issue at some point. But uh, fingers crossed, I guess. Um, so. Nora, you know, another really fascinating report that your organization uh, put out uh, it was one reducing the costs and risks of dementia. And this is obviously, this is a major topic that we get into and, you know, not to compare it to other you know, heart disease and cancer or whatever, but this one, this train is coming. And unlike some of the other ones where we do have some interventions, this one has been, you know, pharmaceutical industry zero, dementia 100. And, um, it's going to take it's going to take a a community and one of the uh, goal you, know, you listed out a series of goals and one of the ones that stood out to me uh, is extremely interesting. I want to talk about is this goal number four where you talk about building a dementia capable workforce across a continuum of care and you point out in the report that. Um, Dementia, this isn't going to be a single magic bullet like the, you know, the pharma industry likes to talk about. You have physicians, you have geriatricians, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. Everyone's got to get together on this one or it's not going to happen. Um, and even, you know, I did a, a show on uh, sort of the sister condition of dementia, which not a lot of people know is delirium, which is mm -hmm. very, you know, it, it overlaps. And, and even people that are really good with dementia don't understand delirium very well. And even at that level. So we really need a, a, a combinatorial approach to all this. Uh, talk a little bit about this goal, if you would. You can talk about the other ones too, because it's a fascinating report. Uh, and the importance of bringing everyone together on this extremely important issue that is coming and it's not going to stop. Sure, I would love to. And, you know, I would say it just, as you mentioned in the start, we launched the Alliance to Improve Dementia Care after we published that report because uh, many of the people that we worked with in, in uh, developing that report said, you know, there's not as much focus on care and improving care. There is all of this intensity around uh, finding a cure, yeah. as, as you mentioned, and some of these um, disease modifying therapies, but not as much on how for those people living with dementia and their caregivers, yep. how do we improve uh, care for them? And that's something that I'm particularly passionate about, because uh, as I mentioned, my father had Alzheimer's disease. My father was a doctor. My sister was a hospital administrator. I'm a health policy wonk. And even with all of our knowledge, uh, we really went through quite a bit uh, trying to get him the right care and the way the healthcare system treated him um, with dementia. And, you know, I could tell many stories about that, but, but I'm just very passionate about improving that care and certainly recognizing the whole person uh, that, you know, is admitted to the hospital living with dementia. And, and we saw this, you know, tragically during pandemic when yep. caregivers weren't allowed to go into the hospital with people living with dementia and, and just how confusing and scary and, um, you know, difficult for people who have cognitive limitations to try to navigate the system by themselves um, is, is really something I'm passionate about. The dementia capable workforce is something that plays into that and uh, really educating health professionals and others about how to work with people with dementia. You mentioned uh, delirium, which is a great example with that, but also just general tips about how to work with someone who's agitated or confused or um, you know, uh, things that we learn from, uh, we have many partners in our program, but, you know, the Alzheimer's Association gives out some great information about how to work with people um, uh, living with dementia. And unfortunately, people get angry with them um, often because they can't answer questions and they get frustrated. And really, you know, um, 
raising your voice or asking them the same question over and over is not helpful. It's just going to make the situation worse. Um, so, but what we've seen is similar, you know, we mentioned the caregivers per se, but also um, just a trajectory of not enough people that are in gerontology or geriatrics. Um, when I was at the White House, one of the programs that we launched as part of the White House Conference on Aging that that um, I'm really proud of is the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Mm. And that is one where they really are recognizing this. You know, we've been trying to recruit more people to geriatrics and geriatricians will be one of the first to tell you, you know, it's one of the few specialties where you go to school for longer to earn less money. So there's not uh, a real economic draw for them. So really trying to integrate geriatric training into primary care is a big goal of the geriatric workforce assessment program and working across disciplines so that the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, um, many of the people that, that older adults come into uh, contact with really have training about how to work with older adults and especially people living with dementia. And so a big part of our goal is trying to, um, you know, make sure that we are training, that we're providing. We've just, we've released two reports since that last one, one looking at disparities. Um, I think, you know, we know, and again, tragically, the pandemic really sh shined a light on the fact that uh, we have huge health disparities between white and non-white populations in our country. And this is true in dementia. African-Americans are three times as likely to get dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, Latinos are five times as likely. They're not part of the research trials. Um, so much of the research that's done is not uh, based on input from them. But also, you know, what are some of these underlying disparities that we can try to improve? And then looking at in the workforce is a huge spectrum. We, our first report looked at detection and diagnosis, early detection and diagnosis being one of the first things we know that can help people uh, really improve their brain health, uh, even get their affairs in order, tell their loved ones their wishes. So everything from early detection and diagnosis to end of life care um, mm -hmm. is really what we're trying to focus there. But, you know, the care really is dependent um, on how well-trained people are. And I, and I just want to say too, sometimes we've had discussions with nurses and, and doctors who say, you know, we're doing the best we can. Don't, you know, don't bash us on this. And, and, and we recognize that I'm a big proponent also of geriatric emergency departments, which are starting to sprout up all over the country, which again, for people living with dementia, you know, there's a San Francisco project that shows uh, over 70% of people that come to an emergency department with dementia don't need to be in an emergency department. Mm. Um, but because of their situation, people get afraid. And then it starts this whole cycle of they get admitted to the hospital and all of this. What, um, you know, the geriatric EDs really has trained people that can help divert and keep uh, people um, that, that can work with them and, and hopefully avoid being admitted to the hospital or have a more tranquil environment for folks. So there are a lot of innovations that are happening, but not fast enough, given our growing uh, elderly population. You know, people look a lot at the baby boomers now, certainly, but I'm on the very tail end of the baby boom population. Um, but the, the, the leading edge uh, are in their 70s now. So, you know, in another 20 years, uh, we'll all be in our 90s, 80s, and 90s. And so that will be a much different uh, environment that we're, that we're looking at. Absolutely. And, and while we're on this theme, before we, we, uh, we get into sort of the financial component of this, um, I just wanted to ask you one other thing, because I watched you um, basically mod moderate a, um, a group uh, at the Milken organization that was, uh, I forget when this was. Uh, it was it was called Building a Mental Health Resilience Amidst Uncertainty. And it was mm. obviously talking about this exchange. Resilience is such an important topic. We don't think as much about it. It's kind of a cool word, but sort of this ability to, to rebound and, and when something negative does happen. And, and you know, you were getting into obviously the mental health issues, the the opioid and, and, the, and the drugs of abuse and, and how that sort of skyrocketed during this, this last year and these periods of loneliness, not just 
just among the elderly, but the younger folks as well. Um, talk a little bit about, about why your, your group in particular was interested in this theme of mental health resilience. Well, mental health is, is one of those issues of the Milken Institute that is goes across centers. Okay. Um, and, and we are big proponents of seeing that mental health is just as important as physical health. Yeah. Um, and I think the pandemic, again, really showed that that uh, not paying attention to people's mental health, you know, depression is the number one disability for workforces um, in the in the US, if not. And I think globally, I think that's actually a World Health Organization figure. Um, and, you know, we don't pay enough attention to that. Now, certainly for older adults, as you mentioned, we see depression associated with um uh, chronic illness, which may be more, uh, more likely when you're older. We see it related to job loss. Some people were forced to have early retirement or are having trouble finding jobs when they want. And so um, this mental health component of aging is a huge part. I'm particularly passionate about it. I uh, talk about my own um, journey of mm -hmm. having uh, major depressive disorder throughout my career, and I've recovered. And I think that um, it's an important message of hope and recovery. Too often, again, we people don't want to talk about mental illness because there's such a stigma associated with it. And so people uh, pretend like they didn't have any problems. And un unfortunately, I think that that makes uh, people you know, live in a closet and not willing to talk about what are some of the treatments, what are some of the things that, that work for people. And the epidemic of loneliness, that was here before the pandemic. And of course, it was just amplified. Um, and as you mentioned, it's not just older adults, certainly those older adults who uh, could not leave their assisted living facility, and many times nursing homes not even leave their room, mm -hmm. suffered uh, tremendous loneliness and, and not able to see their loved ones um, but young people who haven't been able to go to school, uh, you know, just uh, people like us who are working out of our homes now. So I, you know, all these things are so related to our healthy longevity um, and whether or not we are going to have a, a, a good uh, older years, the stress impacts that have on whether or not you get a disease, um, you know, the mental health issues that really affect our health. Um, I think ha people have become more aware of it, but there's still a big stigma attached to it. And I think that we need to be more open and really help, you know, my message really is about building resilience so that, you know, people can see examples of people that have uh, suffered from a mental illness, but have mm -hmm. recovered as well and yep. still been successful and been able to go on. And I think that that can give people hope in the midst of, you know, if they're suffering from a mental health condition to see um, that you can get better. Yep. yep. I appreciate you sharing that, uh, that part of your story. Um, all right. So under your uh, financial uh, wellness umbrella, you, once again, you touch on a, a range in the continuum, everything from retirement, uh, long-term care financing, things of this nature. Uh, one of the, very interesting because we, we've done a couple of shows on um, sort of intergenerational aging and, and, and these issues. And, and, you know, one of the interesting areas that you focus on uh, are intergenerational workforces uh, and the importance of employers understanding there are differences between the younger and older workers. And there's a lot of benefits that come with, with, uh, with that history. Um, talk a little bit about what you're seeing on this front. Uh, I, I know that this is, a major focus of within uh, these different areas that you look at, but um, walk us through a little bit of what you're seeing in terms of intergenerational workforces and, and some of the, I guess, the, the older type of employers and sort of the new economy, uh, sort of longevity economy uh, folks as well. Yeah, you know, it's something that we've been uh, working on and thinking about quite a bit. Um, you know, there is a lot of good data from the Stanford Center on Longevity that has really looked at differences between older and younger workers, see that older workers, you know, tend to have more experience. That's uh, something that comes with being older. Um, yep. 
also can uh, modify their emotions more that are more level in terms of, you know, we've sort of seen more uh, at our, in our older years or don't uh, get stressed out about the same thing. So, so there, there are definitely some things that older workers uh, bring to the table. I think that, you know, the elephant in the room that we have to talk about is often older workers are the first to be let go or given an early retirement because they tend to make more because they have more experience or their health care costs more. So, you know, we've really tried to come up with some solutions that address that. I know, uh, you know, allowing people to use Medicare as their primary uh, health care as opposed to employer could help with with uh, employing older workers. We're also seeing people at, you know, the, the further at the end of their career, maybe not wanting as much responsibility as they had before, working fewer days, but able to lead, uh, you know, really mentor people or bring something there. So really looking at some creative strategies to help people um, stay in the workforce for as long as, pe- as possible. Some people have no choice. Um, you know, they really need the money. And that's also where we focus on financial wellness and, mm-hmm. and the ability to save for retirement or other vehicles there. Um, but also, you know, some people really want to work. They want to contribute um, and, and be part. Some take different career goals and want to try something new as they get older. So there's lots of opportunity for older people. And I, you know, we had a roundtable um, session just last week on the future of retirement. Mm-hmm. And someone suggested, you know, should we retire the word retirement? <laughs> and given the, the trajectory of older populations and, and you know, a, a I'm not sure if you're familiar with Andrew Scott, but uh, sure. he's, they, yeah, and he wrote a wonderful book called, you know, The Hundred Year Life yep. and really talks very passionately about, you know, it's hard to expect that we're going to work 40 years and then support ourselves in retirement for another 30 years. And so we really need to sort of think about how we are staging our careers and what we're doing. We jam everything into our 30s and you have to have children, you have to get your promotion, you have to get your advanced degrees. And, you know, it's a lot on people. So if we look at our longer life as, as a, a dividend, as a, something that, you know, we can really embrace and say, okay, maybe I don't have to do this all in this decade. I could go back to school in my 40s if I want to. I could, you know, um, try a new career later. And I think really looking at things um, from that perspective helps us think about that. I know we have an intergenerational workforce um, at the Center for the Future of Aging, mm-hmm. and it just brings so much more to the table when we talk about things because we all have different life expectancies. I mean, it's experiences. We have a diversity of people as well in terms of ethnicity, um, you know, uh, gender identification, et cetera, which I just feel really, uh, really makes our work much more meaningful and, and, uh, relevant to to everyone, not just people who look like us. Absolutely. Uh, no, what one other thing I want to ask you about? I know this doesn't fall directly under uh, your purview, but you know we mentioned at the uh, the beginning of the show, uh, Mr. Milkins, you know the, the history there in terms of uh, his prostate cancer, and then the, developing the sort of the faster cures initiative, and, and sort of uh, the the need to speed up some of these innovations. We talked about dementia and sort of the, how tough a road that's been. Um, one of the areas that we we've gotten into the show on quite a bit is um, actually the uh, sort of the area of longevity. Uh, biotech research mm-hmm. and and you know we have obviously our government spends a lot on all different types of research national cancer institute national institute of arthritis and uh, musculoskeletal diseases and so forth our national institute for aging well has a nice budget it, it, it's it pales in comparison and mm-hmm. there is a group that believes that um, if we can interfere not with the diseases but behind the diseases, sort of the biology of aging, uh, it doesn't mean we are more immortal. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we live for 500 years, but we compress a lot of the disease that you know we normally deal with for 30 years to, to the very end of life, mm-hmm. and that's trillions of dollars. So they call it the longevity dividend. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd just love to get your thoughts. I, I know this isn't directly under you, but if you could just because uh, you're out there at conferences and in the halls of politics and so forth. Um, Thoughts on 
aging research in terms of slowing the process of aging and uh, how we can maybe make this a, 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 an issue that at least gets the attention of say the National Cancer Institute uh, and put on uh, the topic of aging. Uh, of course, and it, it sounds like you've been talking to Amir Barzilai and, and yeah. uh, David Sinclair and all, all uh, the, all Jim Mellon, and, yeah. and we have, you know, we have good relationships with all of them as well. Um, I would say, you know, it's very promising, the research that they're looking at, and if you, you talk to David Sinclair and Amir Barzilai, they'll tell you they're, they're trying to design it, so we live healthy and then one day all of our organs fail. And right. I'm like, well, you know, that sounds great. Um, if we can, and I think that they're learning a lot about the biology of aging and what we can reverse that really lead to disease. The leading sure. Alzheimer's researchers are also looking at this, yeah. the Alzheimer's Disease Discovery Fund that are very interested in this biology of aging question and how do we look at that? So I do, you know, as we were talking about before, and I think what we're learning more about Alzheimer's disease, it's a very complex disease. Yep. And um, it's going to have a complex solution. It's not going to be one pill that you take no. that uh, just erases Alzheimer's disease. There certainly be things that will help. But I think looking at this whole biology of what's contributing to our health, is, is very promising and should have uh, more funding going into it. I will say politically, it's difficult to get uh, research into some of these issues that aren't so focused on you know, a cure. This is a part where we need to change the politicians' minds so that they have there. There's also the budget issues. You know, when I was uh, at HHS, we really worked on the diabetes prevention program. And to get the Office of Management and Budget to score that, the you know, Washington term being mm -hmm. able to like how it will go in the budget was really difficult. I know the mm -hmm. White House had to put a lot of pressure on them to say, look, we can we see this. And basically the if you don't know about the diabetes prevention program, it's a simple model. It's really, you know, getting people to lose five percent of their body weight. And yeah. it has a huge impact on their diabetes. And it's really diet and exercise. But our budgets, and it's even worse in, you know, privately, I mean, publicly held companies that, that have to cater to their stockholders, we have this five-year window where you have got to show the improvement. And the same thing with the biology of aging, where it's difficult to show that you make this investment and you're going to get an improvement over five years. But the, it's so important for really the long-term trajectory because we keep focusing on the end where people yeah. have these complex illnesses. And one of the things I've often said is, you know, so many of the innovations focus on complex patients and how we deal with reducing costs for these complex patients. And I think I don't want to be a complex patient at all. Like mm -hmm. I want to invest more money in avoiding becoming a complex patient. I think that's what these biotech researchers are, are trying to do. So I, you know, fully support their efforts. I think Politically, it's it's hard uh, to to get those notions there. We have seen a lot of funding go into uh, National Institute on Aging on Alzheimer's disease in particular, yep. and because of that, which they've have a lot more funding than they have before, they have been able to fund these types of initiatives. So I do have hope, um, and you know, encourage people to keep applying for those types of grants to looking at some of these lower cost alternatives. Um, but it's, you know, it is one of those trends in, you know, I, I just recently wrote a piece about mental health too. I yep. see the same thing in mental health. It's the focus is all on that one pill that's going to make you better rather than focusing on the underlying causes of your mental health condition in the first place. And so we as a country have been focused on these quick, fast cures. Let's put a lot of money into it, take a pill and move on. And so you know, I'm a little pessimistic about our ability to really take that long-term view given our political cycles and people wanting to see that, but, but I wholeheartedly endorse it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Nora, while, while I have you, um, just a final sort of wrap up. Um, obviously you were involved in so many things here. Uh, did I miss anything or any, um, conferences you're going to be speaking at uh, now that we're coming out of the pandemic any initiatives coming up that you can talk about uh, let's give you the floor for the uh, uh, the end here uh, you can talk about 
and anything coming Milken Institute or otherwise you're going to be doing in the coming years. Sure, we, you know, we're extremely busy. So thank you uh, for that. We're doing um, our, as I mentioned, we did a future of retirement uh, round table last week. We're doing mm -hmm. uh, a one focused on uh, payment systems for dementia care, uh, collaborative care payment systems that have been at some of the leading academic uh, health centers in the country, such as UCLA, and really trying to spread those uh, in places where we are caring for the whole individual. And that is a combination of building that evidence base, which we have, but also paying physicians and hospitals differently to encourage this collaborative care. And as I mentioned, I'm hopeful about the value-based care um, initiatives and, and where we're going there. We're also been working with the Alzheimer's Society of the UK, which has been uh, really fascinating and doing mm -hmm. some, uh, where they're doing many things similar to us, really trying to focus more on care uh, over cure and integrating health and long-term care. Um, so that that is an initiative where we really have, understand the differences between the European systems and the UK system and the US and, and uh, what works, but they're, far more similarities than differences, I must say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have our Future of Health Summit at the end of June, which mm -hmm. uh, people can log into. Uh, almost all of our sessions will be live streamed. Um, and we have several on aging uh, that we'll be focusing on. And then our global conference is what the Milken Institute is known for. Uh, we typically have you know, uh, five days of programming in Los Angeles is, is generally in the spring. We pushed it back to October this year because of the pandemic, but uh, we are able to do it in person. That's will be our first in-person event since the pandemic. We normally have about four to 5,000 people. We'll have about 2,500, but again, a lot of this will be live streamed. We'll have um, many of the international panels will be there. So I encourage uh, your listeners to tune in to those, to mm -hmm. uh, look at our websites. We're, we're staying very um active and engaged, I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm doing a piece uh, for the Gerontological Society, updating the three trends, hope to have that done uh, this summer, as well as uh, the Alliance um, for Lifetime Income, which I'm a member of, which really mm -hmm. is looking at ways uh, that we can use deferred annuities or other products to help people with the mm -hmm. financial wellness um, and making that tie to long-term care. Um, so, you know, just an abundance of things keeping us busy. I really appreciate you, Ira, giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And, um, you know, I looked at some of your podcasts in preparation and they're just great. So I feel very uh, humbled and honored to be part of uh, the great uh list of guests that you've had before. So really appreciate the opportunity. Well, I, I really appreciate you, Nora, taking the time out of your schedule to do this. And, and we will link to, to everything that you just mentioned. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode uh, on the podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to the superwoman, uh, Nora Super, <laughs> uh, Senior Director of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, also Executive Director of Milken Institute Alliance to Improve the dementia care. Uh, once again, Nora, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Thank you for what you're doing at the Milken Center. And as we say on our show, thank you for helping to uh, create a better tomorrow with your initiatives. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. My, stuff. my pleasure. Thank you so much, Ira. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>